food-producing nation. But how much do you know about this valuable yet finite resource? On our radio program, Guyana's Oil & You, we strike at the heart of every issue with informed views and credible data. The time is now for you to arm yourself with insightful knowledge on your oil well. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to this special edition, our end of year program for our radio show, Guyana's Oil and You. I am your hostess, senior journalist of Kaitro News, Kiana Wilberg, and today we will be reflecting on Guyana's performance as an oil producing state. While considering the steps necessary for success in 2021 and beyond, I'm pleased to report that our panel for this critical discussion is not only diverse in its background, but also balanced in gender representation. We have two truly experienced and distinguished women on our panel today, international lawyer Ms. Melinda Janke and Chatham House Associate Fellow Dr. Valerie Marcel. Joining them are two prominent and knowledgeable gentlemen. We have the former minister, Mr. David, Patterst Mr. David Patterson, who has served as the, who's currently serving as the head of the Parliamentary Public Accounts Committee and he's also the executive member of the Alliance for Change Party. Also, we have Mr. Tom Sanzillo, the Director of Financial Analysis at the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. To the members of the panel, good morning again, and thank you for being part of this discussion. Good morning, Kiana. Good morning. Oh, pleasure, my pleasure. Great. Morning, so. Thank you very much. So we'll head right into our discussion. I would like to give each member of the panel about two to three minutes maximum to present perspectives on Guyana's preparation for oil and its performance in its first year as an oil producing state. And I would like to have this discussion uh, started with comments from Dr. Marcel and then we'll follow with Mr. Sanzillo. Well, thanks, Kiana. Um, obviously, I'm not in Guyana and uh, participating in these preparations, so this is really an external perspective uh, that I can offer. Um, but it seems that um, there's been, you know, for the last uh, five years, uh, really intense preparations for the, pre the production phase, uh, and a tremendous amount has been done. Um, on local content, on the regulations, uh, policies, and laws that are necessary to oversee uh, oil operators in this highly technical, super expert uh, sector. Uh, so that's very impressive. I think um, the, the big job uh, in preparation on the economy is, is I think, a mammoth task uh, that is to get the supply base, get the skills, uh, get the infrastructure uh, to be developed, to be able to support the sector, but much more importantly than that, to be able to be productive uh, in parallel to the sector and so that the sector doesn't sort of take over everything. So I think there are so many, <laughs> there are so many things for Guyana to do in a very short amount of time. And so it can't be expected to have it all sorted, but I think it's been very impressive so far. Thank you very much for that comment, Dr. Marcel. Over to you, Mr. Senzillo. Yeah, uh, thanks for uh, having me uh, this morning um, and for inviting me back. This is the second time I've been on the show. Yes. Um, the, we uh, put out a study uh, a couple months ago and um, looked at this from a, from a fiscal um, standpoint and looked at the, the uh, commitment no promise that were made where the um, um, resources from the um, oil um, drilling would would um, would do um, one of three things and and eventually all three things um, to uh, pay bills uh, at the end of the month so to speak close the government's deficit 
um, it would um, <clears throat> allow the, um, uh, the government to put money aside, build a fund like we've seen in other countries, um, and uh, to engage in some new spending um, that uh, have been put off because of um, uh, deficits for a while. We have the end of the first year, um, and we had suggested that the money that would come in would not um, cover the f uh, current year fiscal deficit, and we were accurate, it didn't. Um, and, um, and so the other two aspects of, uh, of uh, the arrangement of putting, putting money aside or spending on new, we just don't know. We'll know next month when the, uh, when the budget comes out as to how they might want to to use the, uh, I think it's, they said $185 million in the newspapers. Um, but so, and uh, the, um, um, during the budget announcement um, uh, uh, by Minister Edgehill said that the, um, they didn't meet the uh, production targets either. So I, there's no real fiscal target because nobody's disclosed any. Um, and the one, uh, uh, volume target or how many barrels um, it, it was not um, uh, met in the first year. Thank you very much for that, sir. Now I'd like to turn our attention to two individuals who've been uh, commenting, if not on a uh, weekly basis, but at the very least on a monthly basis on Guyana's oil sector. I'd allow Ms. Ajanki to provide her perspectives on Guyana's preparation and her take on the performance for the first year. Thank you very much, Kiana. Um, I would I would say that Guyana is totally unprepared for oil, and um, and has had a, really a disastrous year. You have a horrible, abusive, exploitative contract. We have strong laws in this country, yet we have a sector that is riddled with illegalities. You've heard the lie of of vast wealth when in fact we're going to end up with massive debt. And the oil curse is here. We started this year, January, with Global Witness telling the people of Guyana they would get 168 billion. Global Witness lied to you. You're not going to get 168 billion. Valerie said that the Global Witness report was like throwing a bomb into the election fray. And that was absolutely right. And I want to thank you for saying that because it was spot on. The possibility of oil money destroys democracy. And we saw that. Just a few weeks later, in the March election, when there was an attempt to steal the election by declaring fraudulent results, and of course it didn't work, because the Guyanese people said no, no matter who they voted for, the country was united that they were not going to have electoral fraud. But we still had five months of an election fiasco. In August, there's a new government. In September, they approved Payara. Now, there are good grounds for saying that that Payara environmental permit is unlawful. There are good grounds for saying that the Payara petroleum license is unlawful under the petroleum laws. I've asked Minister Barrett to give his reasons for granting the Payara license. Two months later, he can't provide an answer. They rush Payara through and they hire Alison Redford to help them. Who is this? A disgraced Canadian politician who had to resign over a money scandal. And Kaito News has reported that she previously received money from an Exxon subsidiary. So the government's not protecting Guyana from an abusive deal, and they're rushing through things like Payara and helping Exxon Mobil. And for the whole of this year, ESSO has flared billions of cubic feet of natural gas. They're poisoning the air with chemicals. Those chemicals, some of them cause cancer. Flaring reduces greenhouse gases which affect the climate system, damaging the climate. Mr. Jack Deo is on record as saying that climate change is an existential threat for Guyana, but the government does nothing about it. I've told the EPA the flaring was illegal. I told them to shut down Exxon's operations and make Exxon pay compensation, but they're not doing their job. All of this is the oil curse. Guyana is totally unprepared for oil. Thank you very much, Ms. Janke. Mr. Patterson, uh, you would have heard three uh, interesting comments uh, thus far on Guyana's preparation. Uh, from the view of the political opposition, uh, what has been 
uh, most telling for you in terms of Guyana's uh, preparation? I know that prior to being in the political opposition, you were also part of the uh, process in helping Guyana to prepare for oil and gas. So it would be interesting to hear you speak a little bit on that front, as well as your views on the performance of the country in its first year. Thank you very much, Guyana. Good morning or afternoon, wherever you are, to my fellow panelists. Uh, first, um, Kiana, aside from the vexing issue of the conditions of the contract, including, of course, the continued narrative, which administration is more responsible for its contents or not. I mean, my view, as I share with Valerie, that I think that the country has made um, some progress in the oil and gas sector. Um, on the, and let me state on the contract and the contract negotiation calls that you will, um, you've heard and they continue um, to hear. Um, on behalf of the opposition, which I am now on, I mean, we are on record as stating um, that, and I repeat this now, that should the government uh, want to make any changes which will ensure more benefits, because I do think we are getting some benefits now, but I think Thomas and everyone's on and of course, um, not the amount of benefits that persons uh, would like. We, as the opposition, will provide unconditional support um, for any changes um, that the government would like to make. We never had that opportunity. That offer was never made to us when we in government, but um, being that as it may, um, we, and I've stated it on record already, and I've stated it again, we, we, we will very willing to make um, support unconditionally the government in this endeavor. Um, I think that in the last four years, uh, we have as a country made remarkable progress um, for towards <laughs> first oil. Um, remember that we have started, we started a brand new industry and I do understand um, several persons called about um, the need for to be cautious as, as, we, as we approach for soil. Um, but we did make and we have made remarkable progress in as far as um, as we are concerned. Um, we as a coalition ensured all strategies, plans um, were implemented and grounded in fundamental principles uh, there's a good balance between the economics of production and protection of the environment um, and ensure that the environment will never be compromised for production. Um, there were bold actions and measures in place by the coalition when we did there, including fines, prosecutions. Um, we had recommended um, modification of the PRFDA and FDP permits based on the pitfalls. And we do acknowledge that they were pitfalls and lessons learned um, from LISA 1 and LISA 2. Uh, we, had, and we, we had recommended certain issues. I mean, two great examples would be the question of flaring, as Melinda um, just mentioned, and the dumping of produced water in the ocean. We've also established, that there's also established right now the Sovereign's Wealth Fund to ensure that the oil and gas wealth is prudently spent and invested in the best interest of the country. Um, moving forward, moving forward, we do reckon that we have to seriously examine the ability of the to, toil, to turn this oil wealth into more sustainable industries in the best interest of, of this country and its people. Um, for Guyana to escape the fate of other oil resource rich countries, we need to ensure that it's equity in terms of access to this wealth and how it's invested in the population. So all in all, I do think the last year, or I mean, as I said, at the one last year as a oil producer, what first year as oil producing nation was um, a learning curve, but I do think that, that we have um, done uh, reasonably well as a country um, in our first year of oil. But we still have a long way to go as everybody will acknowledge, but this is a, um, a reasonable first step in our opinion. Thank you very much, Mr. Patterson. Uh, based on all of the perspectives that have been put forward, I'd like to ask Dr. Marcel. Um, Guyana is part of the new producers group that is led by Chatham House, and it's provided this platform where we can take important lessons from uh, other countries that are part of the industry and sort of navigate our way using some of the uh, best practices that they perhaps have been implementing and have seen success with. Uh, 
based on uh, the role that you have to play in leading the new producers group and Guyana being part of that, Dr. Marcel, would you say that some of the issues you're now hearing, uh, were these part of those discussions? That's one. And two, what are some important lessons you would try to uh, ensure that Guyana at, th at this particular point, this learning curve, um, ensure that it pays attention to so that it can avoid some of the pitfalls of the sector? Yeah, thanks. I, I think there are so many to 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 bring up. Frankly, there's you know I I think one of the one of the big issues is um, that I think w when you're when you're rushing to prepare after a discovery to prepare the production phase, there are so many things to do, and there there the list is very long. All the regulations you have to draft, the institutions you have to set up. Um, you get you can have trouble seeing the forest for the trees, and I think a common lesson across the group is that governments may forget to or not take the time to stop and think what is it for, what is the oil for, what are we going to do with the gas, what are we going to do with the money, how does this all fit into the bigger plan, what is the bigger plan. Um, do we need to completely change our bigger plan because of this? Or do we stay focused on what we had in sight before? You know, I think those are real fundamental questions that almost all uh, producers face because after, after a discovery, there's such excitement and you're very focused on the different tasks that you have. Not to mention, you have all these consultants coming in uh, to advise you and, and give you these sort of detail-oriented uh, tasks and, 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 and things to focus on. And so you, you don't have that sort of space in which to, to reflect on where you're heading. So I think that's a big one. Uh, one small one just in relation to, I mean, it's not a small one, but I, I think one specific issue that is very important is um, avoiding flaring. Um, now that is something that has uh, been a huge challenge across our group. Uh, because you want to get to production quickly because you want the oil to come out to have the revenue. But if you rush that, you don't have the infrastructure in place to capture the gas. You don't have a policy to determine what you're going to do with the gas. You don't have institutions that are strong enough to sort of twist the arm of the operator and say, no, you can't flare and you can't just pay a fine to continue flaring. And it, it's, it's a very difficult issue for an emerging producer, even for an established producer to remedy. Um, but I think it's really an important one because if you get flaring right, and in the sense, if you avoid the flaring of associated gas while you're producing oil, uh, that's really a sign that you've got a lot of things in place in your checkerboard. Uh, and it would be sort of a, a reassuring sign of, of the state of the industry. Uh, I would say, something important to focus on. Thank you for that contribution. I'd like to uh, give the floor over to Mr. Sanzillo. I know that you would have uh, heard a lot of perspectives uh, thus far. And uh, given the really uh, insightful report that was put forward by the institute uh, that you're part of, um, we seem to be on an, an aggressive uh, pathway to the development of our oil. Would you say that Guyana runs the risk of being on a dangerous precipice if we don't uh, stop and try to fix some of the provisions in the contract that I know that you would have spoken on uh, quite a few times? Do you think that we're placing ourselves in a dangerous position? Yeah, I think that I, th I, I think what Valerie just said, I am um there's a lot to um, um, agree to agree with, um, but um, the government has elected to um, move forward um, probably um, too quickly um, and um, is not in a position to um, handle it. And the contract is evidence of that. It's a, a contract that is fatally flawed in numerous areas. Um, but the thing that if I now being in the position that I'm in and, you know, you can go off into a thousand different directions and there are issues um, for sure. 
But the one thing that you, it, the purpose of this exercise um, is to get Guyana money. And, um, and if you don't focus on that, you know, what's the point? Um, and right now, um, the contract is poorly written. Um, uh, it doesn't appear that there's audit capacity um, to deal with it. Um, and so um, you're not really in a position to know whether or not the country is getting the dollars that it's supposed to get um, and then the other issues that the uh, Mr. Patterson raised about the Sovereign Wealth Fund and all is, they're all vitally important. But first you have to have the money and you have to have the money that you're entitled to before you can start the discussion of spending it. And right now um, the country's not in a position um, to, um, um, to uh, enforce the poor contract that they have. Okay, Ms. Janke, thank you very much, sir, for your contribution. Uh First of all, uh, Ms. Janke, do you have any uh, perspectives that you'd like to offer before we close this first round of our discussion? Yes, please. I'd like to um, do a sort of a reality check. Um, there is no excuse for this contract. It is abusive and exploitative. And if, if you talk to people, you will hear that the people of Guyana have had enough of an, ex of an abusive, exploitative oil deal with ExxonMobil and its partners. In terms of the money, I agree with, uh, with Tom completely. If the purpose of this is to, is to get in money, and uh, we've heard promises of vast wealth, the promises of vast wealth are in fact lies, and Guyana is going to end up with massive debt, already has um, massive debts that it has to pay, including $460 million of pre-contract costs for which there appears to be no legal basis. And I want to just um, conclude this by, well, not conclude, but when we talk about the Sovereign Wealth Trust Fund, that fund is not lawful. David Granger signed as the president of Guyana when he was not president of Guyana. He ceased to be president of Guyana under the constitution in December 2018 and therefore could not sign any law in January when he purported to do so. So the Sovereign Wealth Trust Fund does not have a legal basis in Guyana's laws and people need to ask where is that money going and who is responsible for it? In terms of the flaring, the flaring is already illegal under the laws of Guyana. It is unlawful for ExxonMobil to be using the faulty equipment that they did. There are provisions already which say that the associated natural gas must be used in production or it must be reinjected. If it, if it has no commercial value, then it has to be disposed of. Clearly, it has no commercial value because otherwise Exxon would be selling it. So the legal structure is there, but it is being ignored. The EPA is not doing its job of enforcing the Environmental Protection Act and the government is not doing its job of protecting the people and following, following the laws that are there. We have strong laws. Thank you very much for that contribution there, Ms. Janke. I'd like to turn to the issue of- uh, uh, Kiana, just uh, allow me sure. one second. So, um, sure. I, thank you very much. I, I fully agree with, with Melinda and Valerie when it comes to the question of flaring, um, they mean obviously that is a vaccinary issue, um, and I did it, and I and we have acknowledged it that in the uh, FDP for Lisa one and two, the question of flaring was not um, adequately addressed. But I do think that EPA prior to um, September were um, making steps to uh, to correct that. On the matter of the, the gas having no commercial um, value. I, I, I would disagree with that. And on the question of what is legal in the sovereign world fund or not, um, once again, that's what the courts are there to, def, um, to, to determine. I, I do think that there is a, a case. So if, and, um, if the sovereign world fund act um, that was signed in January of 2019, if that's legal or not, um, 
obviously the courts can decide that, but from from my perspective, I, it's from my knowledge that the funds are going into um, from from the, the information that we have that we we up to August, whatever funds we have garnered are going into that um, fund. Uh, so, uh, I mean, but if someone wants to challenge the legality of it, I mean, um, they should. But we can't just simply throw away the baby in the bathwater with the bathwater and say that it is not um, legal. Don't without any um, legal justification and don't actually enact or try to seek to enact what is there right now. Just wanted those uh, comments on the record. Thank you. Uh, on the issue of gas, um, I know Ms. Mr. Patterson, uh, during your time uh, prior to 2020, you would have served as the Minister of Public Infrastructure where you would have engaged in discussions with ExxonMobil on matters related to bringing gas to shore uh, before 2024. Uh, can you say uh, a little bit about what some of those discussions entailed? Uh, that's one and two. Where do you see Guyana's future uh, with oil and gas? With Sorry, not just oil and gas, but particularly gas, especially since there are a lot of safeguards which are not in place as yet. Do you think it's proper for us to move uh, so aggressively towards this end when the right legal and regulatory safeguards are still absent? Thank you for everything. Speaking uh, about gas, gas for sure, man, and that's, that was a, a, a sector which was under my uh, direct uh, control up to 2018 before the establishment of the Department of Energy. Um, first, let's say this. Um, we have to all, always put um, gas and power in the context of where Guyana is at the moment. At the moment, we produce 100% of our um, electricity from um, hydrocarbons, um, heavy, heavy fuel oil, uh, which is, you know, is a, is a major pollutant and the burning of these in production bid. Um, currently, we, um, as a country, we still do have marginally thin um, reserves, electricity reserves. So obviously, and then obviously, and, and we have a very fragile infrastructure. So the idea of bringing um, gas to shore for the for the sole purpose of, of generating electricity was one which um, I myself personally champion um, as a first as, as an economic venture, I mean, it, it is cheaper. It would be very much cheaper as in the environmental. It, it is uh, um, not as, it's not renewable, but it's clean. It's considered clean energy. And secondly, that this was this gas to shore project would have been the very first big project from the oil and gas discovery, which would have direct impact, which would have had direct impact on the lives of all Guyanese. Um, therefore, as you are aware, Kian, we spent I, I spent a tremendously long time um, doing several studies, engaging several international institutions, the World Bank, um, IDB, the government of Japan. We independently commissioned um, several studies to ensure that um, that at least this very first project, if ever executed, would be successful. Um, of course, with the establishment of the Department of Energy, all the work was handed over to, to that agency in, in August 1, 2018. But at the time of, um, of August 2018, we had furthered several um, studies. The only outstanding issue was um, the question of a location. Um, we had approached the World Bank as well as the Japanese government to lend us experts, maybe just like Thomas, on um, the question of the pricing, the cost. I mean, we had advanced with with, with Exxon uh, Mobil the, um, the the government's position, my position at the time, that we should only be paying, we should only re be repaying them for the transportation of the gas, which is the pipeline, um, not the gas itself. I mean, that was um, and, and at the time, while that discussion was going on in the 2018, 2017, 2018, Exxon was on a tremendous um, pressure internationally from persons such as um, newspapers as yourself as well as Melinda, her group on the, on the equity of the contract. So they were very amenable in 2018 at that particular time to um, consider our uh, proposal, which and it, um, which is the question of the only cost for the gas that, that can be recovered was for the cost of the pipeline coming to shore. And um, 
we also, um, but, but knowing that we had a capacity deficit in the sense of the financial, um, and we were at a disadvantage, uh, we, uh, we asked the World Bank to, to present the team and the Japanese government. And I do think those teams were um, actually hired, but they went to the Department of Energy. Unfortunately, I'm, I am unaware um, at the extent, I mean, I'm unaware of what transpired from 2018 to now. Um, but I know, I knew at the time that, that since being with us, we were very close to uh, an arrangement to, um, to have the gas come to shore. And we were talking about the, um, the cost, well, of course, the cost per cubic meter that the government was going to pay, but just obviously the transportation costs to recoup the cost of constructing the pipeline. We had several um, various theories and uh, recommendations, who should own the pipeline, who should build the pipeline and those things like that. And that was um, being considered. Mm -hmm. We also um, had several advice, I mean, to also tell you on the question of, of obviously at the time at, in 2018, it was 30 million cubic feet per day. Um, obviously, Guyana would not be able to utilize that immediately as soon as you land, land the pipeline. So, so therefore, the, the recommendation of, of deferred um, allocation, deferred um, cause of pay, take or pay um, issue. I mean, obviously, they, they would like to recoup the money for the pipeline as soon as possible. But experts are, were there, already there like, advising us on the process in which we would um, we can continue and how we can progressively bail out the, the, uh, the in the electricity sector. So our idea was actually to have a, a discussion. We also had a um, recommendation of procurement. Um, it was recommended that we go to for for the um, for the actual generations and those things that we go to public procurement as opposed to entering into sole sourcing with any one um, engine manufacturer and those things like that. So at the at, at June, July 21st, 2018, the government's concern would have been the infrastructure to distribute the electricity, which is on the GPL, and um, and we would follow the advice of the um, experts in landing into site and then uh, converting the natural gas into electricity. So um, I mean, but we do think it's a viable project. I mean, um, obviously, you know, that for electricity purposes, Guyana's electricity needs have been going 7% per, per annum since um, 2015. Um, as I said, as, as everyone is, is, can know frequently, we have a lot of power outages purely because of the poor state of our, our, our grid, as well as the lack of generating capacity in the country. So um, we will be supporting as, as a, um, any project that brings power to shore um, for the purpose of generating electricity. And finally, Kiana, I, I want to say that that that, that unlike um, other persons, I never viewed this as a um, as a single standalone project. I, I I viewed it as a one of many, um, in, in whichever form that we would do. But obviously, um, but, uh, so we need to maximize the, the the amount of gas we're getting, the associated gases we are getting in, um, from these fields. So we viewed it as one project primarily to ensure it out that, um, that, that we can benefit the country um, and move our trajectory um, from just um, where we are at, provide cheap electricity to, 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 to boost and to kickstart some sort of industrialized growth, and um, obviously to the benefit of all. Uh, that was uh, quite a comprehensive uh, uh, comment there, uh, Mr. Patterson. But, um, what I really was uh, trying to get from you is if you believe that it is still uh, critical for us to move ahead with such uh, a project when many of the regulatory and uh, legislative uh, uh, framework that we should have in place are still absent. But uh, before I hand uh, the floor back to you, I'd like to uh, get some input from the other members of the panel. Uh, Mr. Sanzillo, I'd like to uh, hear your uh, comments in this regard. Well, on the on the gas situation, it'd be just a, a couple of a uh, uh, quick ones. I mean, sure. I, I recognize the, um, the desire to use the resource um, in a, in the way um, it was described, um, but um, it's based on kind of a uh, a view of oil and gas markets that maybe existed ten years ago. Um, right now, the world has an oversupply of gas, um, and there's no um, real need for it in the world market system, and that's largely because the price of, um, of uh, renewal, 
we well, largely because of uh, oversupply, <clears throat> but also um, in many places that we're in 30 countries around the world, and we don't know of any place in the world where an aggressive um, renewable energy um, plan uh, would be would be more expensive than uh, than um, than even the gas infrastructure costs that Mr. Patterson was uh, speaking to. Um, and the other one, I have to be frank. I'll be frank about this. Um, the way that the um, contracts were negotiated um, for this oil um, endeavor gives me no confidence that there that the country has an ability to negotiate a pipeline and power plants and other infrastructure um, on a price that would actually be affordable. I have no evidence of that. We have no evidence of that. We have evidence to the contrary. Um, and I'm not sure, but I didn't hear whether or not there was a, a comparable analysis of uh, whether or not there was a cost comparison between, you know, where the renewable markets are and where the um, um, and how the, the arrangement would be in uh, in Guyana, the proposed arrangement. So I, I would say that you have a real um, uh, a viable alternative um, that doesn't bring with you the whole host of, um, of uh, issues that you raised and which Guyana is unprepared to deal with. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to turn to uh, Ms. Janke, uh, you've been uh, very, uh, very um, interested in this particular area where gas is concerned and uh, striving to ensure that some of the pitfalls of this particular area are known and to call upon our leaders to put measures in place to safeguard the country. Uh, what are your thoughts on Guyana's aggressive move to bring gas to shore? I think the idea of using the gas to bring it to shore is completely economically and environmentally irresponsible. I've got two, two things to say. One is that this is going to result in massive debt. And secondly, that at the moment this is illegal. So under Section 17 of the Environmental Protection Act, any policy decision that might have an impact, a significant impact on the environment has to have an environmental impact assessment. That was not done. So before there is any move to do this gas, there needs to be an environmental impact assessment and the decision to do the gas should have should be quashed. We shouldn't even be paying attention to that. There must be an environmental impact assessment first. Secondly, environmentally, gas is not clean energy. I don't know who put this myth out, but gas with gas, you get methane leaks, which are 80 times more dangerous than carbon dioxide, which is the major greenhouse gas. So you're contributing to climate change in a country that is particularly vulnerable to climate change. In terms of the money, um, we have, oh, I just come back to the illegality. We have already said that Guyana will go to 100% renewable energy by 2025. That's a policy decision. There is also a submission that Guyana has made in its intended nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement, which is a legally binding treaty where Guyana has said we will go to 100% renewable energy by 2025, provided that we get the financing. Now we hear there is no financing for renewable energy, but there is financing for what is essentially a lunatic gas project. $400 million for a pipeline that is very dangerous, but no money for the... Sorry, can you hear me? I've lost connection. Yes, we, I can hear you now. I'm, I'm, are the honor members of the panel uh, hearing as well? Yes. Um, okay, Ms. Janke, you can go her. ahead. No, I think we, she's, we lost her. Yeah, I think we lost her. Yeah. All right. Tatiana, so, um, yes, yes. One, one second, Mr. Patterson. I think Ms. Janke, can you hear us? Okay, I think that she's uh, going to go back offline and return to us. But in the meantime, um, Mr. Patterson, I do hope that you're making your, your comments because I will uh, afford you mm -hmm. another opportunity to answer uh, 
the first question that was asked about this and to respond to some of the comments you've heard this far. In the meantime, I'd like to ask Dr. Marcel uh, to provide us with your uh, insight, the global perspective that you would have been able to have on some of these projects and what lessons Guyana should pay attention to as it moves towards uh, uh, developing this resource. Thanks, Jana. Um, on the gas uh, issue, I mean, I think it's clear that at the time, I, d I don't think Guyana was expecting that there would be as much associated gas in these projects as there, there is. And so it's actually a substantial uh, resource. Um, so there's a lot of gas and it can't all be re-injected. Uh, and now the pressure that international oil companies are under uh, big and small from investors really pushes them to avoid flaring and methane leakage um, and environmental damage, of course. Uh, they're, they're under huge pressure to show that their production is not associated with flaring and methane leakage. So there's a big now new incentive for a company like Exxon, um, which is maybe not succumbing to that pressure as much as the European oil companies. Exxon is the one that sort of, uh, uh, I think, has a bit of the head in the sand with regards to some of the growing environmental, um, well, voluntary principles that companies are following now. But still, um, I think there's a real common interest in doing something productive with the gas. The question is the affordability. Uh, once it gets to shore, it's putting in place, having this sort of sequence like a domino to get everything in place in a, in a, in a suit and the right amount of time to minimize costs um, so you can bring it to shore. But I don't think that, um, I don't think it should be the be all end all for Guyana because of course the hinterland will not be connected to uh, power like a grid, power grid. And so renewables are really important for addressing the power needs of a huge part of the Guyanese territory. So it's not the, the full solution, but I think it's, it's um, there is value in the project on, I mean, I say that without having been reading any of the feasibility studies or, or the economics of it, just at a, at a principal level, I think it can make sense. I wanted to just uh, react very quickly to something um, that the methane leaks that were mentioned before, gas production is not associated with methane leaks necessarily. Oil production can also create methane leaks. Uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a mistake of a poor production uh, to have methane leaks and it can be very easily addressed and it's a, a very easy issue to resolve uh, for, and for a government to watch carefully. And the company would want to avoid that now as well. Uh, before the end of the show, I hope I can come back to the contract issue, um, Absolutely. if you allow me, Kenna. You want, should I say something now or yes, wait yes, till later? Yes, yes, you can uh, go ahead. Okay. I know there's so much talk about renegotiating the contract, and I know I understand how frustrating it is for Guyana to be in an unfavorable contract. Um, I, I wanted to just raise the, the contrary view to some of the points made uh, uh, in the program, which is that, you know, uh, I think renegotiating an existing contract isn't the sort of the panacea that it could be presented. Um, now, the market, the, the oil market has changed so much. Oil companies are under tremendous pressure right now from investors. They, the, the idea that, that the, to renege on an, on an, on a, on an, an agreement is is not ne not necessarily the, the the right time to do that. There are many opportunities for bringing a company to the table to force some, well to to bring them to make some concessions uh, that are much more beneficial to the country. Every time they ask for an extension, every time they want to avoid a penalty, every time they come back asking for something, the companies are always coming back to governments asking for something. And each one of those opportunities is a moment to negotiate something and to trade for something you want. So I, I don't think it's that important. And I want to emphasize that I think the project design is much more, that's where the, the big value is. I mean, we're always focused on the contract 
terms and, and how much money you get from a contract. But really, it's it's the way you design a project, the, how the Payara Field Development Plan was reviewed. Was did the government uh, have all the all the tools and the time and the capacity to be able to 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 ensure that 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 field was developed in the best interest of of the Guyanese state? That's where the big value is. It's not the sexy part of the discussion, but it's where the big value is. So I just wanted to put that out there because I think it's really important. Yes, and I uh, do agree with you. In fact, that's one of the uh, next topics that we will be turning to, field development costs. But before we, not just the field development costs, but the field development plans and uh, the effective review of those um, plans. Now, before we uh, get to that aspect of our discussion, uh, for those who are now joining us, uh, Ms. Janke just had a bit of a technical uh, issue earlier, and so she has rejoined the discussion. I would just like to offer her the opportunity to finish her remarks on the issue of bringing gas to shore, and then we will allow uh, Mr. Patterson the opportunity as well to respond to some of the comments made and to uh, also answer the question that was asked. Thank you very much. So I'm sorry about that. Um, what I had said was that I did, I think the gas to shore project is a lunatic project really for two reasons. One, the illegalities associated with this project, including um, the failure to carry out an environmental impact assessment and the fact that we have an international obligation which says that we will go to 100% renewable energy by 2025, provided that we have the money, we cannot now turn around and spend that money on, on natural gas. Environmentally, um, this is a, a gas is a disaster. It is not cleaner energy. The comparison is between the current supply of energy, which is a heavy fuel oil, which is a terrible supply, and renewable energy. Where is the economic analysis that shows that natural gas is better for Guyana than renewable energy? There has been a complaint to the United Nations Committee on the elimination of racial discrimination because the gas project will come to the coast and it appears that it will only supply people along the coast unless Guyana is going to invest in massively expensive infrastructure. But the debt, the money to pay for this burdens the entire country and therefore puts a disproportionate uh, detriment on the Amarinian people of Guyana. What steps are being taken to protect them from what is really an economically foolish um, proposition. The associated gas under the contract is supposed to be supplied free of charge, although there are massive expenses on getting it to the to the coast and then putting it into the infrastructure. For the non associated gas, there is a formula. Obviously, before you do a gas project, you must know what is the source of your gas? What is the cost? I've asked Minister Barrett, what gas are you using or proposing to use? He doesn't know. After two months, he comes back to me and says, your questions are technical in nature and we will endeavor to answer them at a later stage. How can you possibly decide to do a gas project and you don't know what gas you're going to use? So it seems to me that we're being driven to use the gas because it's being flared by ESSO, not because there is a, as a reason not because Guyana needs the gas, because we don't. We're going to go 100% renewable by 2025. We're not going to be using this gas. What we have is, a, is this idea to use it because Exxon is, ESO is flaring and the World Bank wants to dismantle Guyana's laws, which already make that flaring illegal, and allow ESO to flare until 2030 under their so-called zero flaring initiative which is not a zero flaring initiative, but a let's flare until 2030 initiative. The Guyanese people need to be very, very careful when they hear that the World Bank is involved in anything. The gas project in Ghana, the Sankofa project, has burdened the Ghanaian people with gas that they don't want and that they have to pay for every year. So in my view, 
The gas, is, the gas to shore project is a non-starter economically and environmentally. I would defer to Tom Sanzillo on the questions of the cost of gas, the cost of the pipelines and the future of the gas sector. And I completely agree with the points that he made. This is not cheap electricity. I have never heard of cheap electricity where just the pipeline is going to cost you 400 million US dollars, according to the figures put out by the previous government and the current government. Thank you very much, Ms. Janke. Uh, Mr. Patterson, I'll turn the floor over to you to respond to the comments that you would have heard. Right. Um, I, I want to make this as quick as possible. Um, yes. From my knowledge, Melinda was associated gas, and, um, but obviously the new administration may have different ideas of what associated gas and non-associated gas is. Um, I, I thank Valerie for her comments. I think Melinda missed them on, on the question of uh, clean energy um, and pollutants and those things like that, and I endorse that. On the question of um, renewable energies and the question of depowering the Guyana is quite a large country for your views, it's about the same size as Great Britain. And Valerie and Melinda and Tom, you're all absolutely correct. A gas assure project will only benefit the interconnected grid, which is um, Linda, which is about um, half of our regions. Currently, right now, in the 2020 budget, that I know that for sure because I particularly signed it, there are four hydro projects to address um, hinterland communities, four solar um, farm to address these areas. The idea was always was to the, the larger population centers, you know, in the towns that you have let them, uh, Madia, Mabaruma, Bartika, they were, they're going to be powered by renewable energies and the transition to a renewable um, a green state will have started from the out, um, in the, the, the hinterland regions and coming, I'm coming towards the coast because obviously the requirement, the energy requirement for those um, areas, for those communities are far less. Um, so the, 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 there is a, an existing um, hydropower going going on in, 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 the, in the village of Cato. Um, so the large population centers outside of um, Georgetown where, where, where will be, I reckon, sometime before 2022, 2023, um, powered by hydro uh, or renewable energies. The question of the transition, Thomas and Melinda, of, of, from us going to renewable energies, um, that there is a study. It, it, it's, it's on. It's on. You. It's available in the family. And if you haven't seen it, I will willing to, 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 to send it to you. It is online. It is online, um, and, it, and it and it does address the question of how we can transition from right now brown fuel to clean fuel. You know, I know you disagree what clean fuel, um, as well as go to 100% renewable. The major issue um i would say um linda is that you have to know that the, the hydro and the the, the the renewable energy capacities of our country are lie in the hinterland in the region eight and region nine the, the major the hydro they are in region nine um in those areas that's where our, our, our hydro potential it is tremendously costly you mean you're talking about 400 million dollars of pipe it is tremendously costly to bring up to set up a medium scale um, hydropower and then um, get the power to our, to our centers in Guyana. The Myla Falls project, which is studied, that's $1.2 billion over an eight year period if we have to start today. Um, so, um, so I mean, and, and obviously, and in the interim between starting and, 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 and um, having power brought to shore, uh, power brought hydropower brought to the, the urban centers. We still have to cater for the needs of the Guyanese people. Um, the studies which you can look at, Melinda, show that 40% of any um, cost that we would do will go into transmission and distribution. On the question of um, Thomas, on the question of, 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 of the Guyana having the capacity to negotiate an economic contract, and I absolutely agree with you. And we were not at the stage of us entering into an economic. Um, contract we had asked for help support in doing that but um we were i was very convinced that thought as a transition of fuel that, that it would be um long the contracts and, and the regulations were in place it would be beneficial to the country otherwise there is um, um there is a study one once again which, which is available online as well i'm surprised it's not seen which shows it, it, it gives us the various alternatives in comparison if we continue with using hfo 
um, um, and I look forward to, to fund and to work on our engineers, how much it would cost us vis-a-vis -vis trying to use the natural gas. So we were not at the position of, a, of um, negotiating the economic thing. What we were doing is trying to see if it's technically feasible, which it was, uh, which it is, and, um, and how we can do this. And then obviously um, we, would, we, were, we were seeking help to, to get it done. Um, yeah, so so they so right now, um, as, as as you know, uh, there there is about uh, currently uh, about almost um, sixty megawatts of renewable energy which will be in place by twenty twenty five. That's the date that we give um, Melinda. The date His Excellency gave twenty twenty five was extremely, extremely ambitious, but um, obviously um, he is the president, and I obviously didn't uh, question it. But he did have a caveat. Um, funding available, and unfortunately, the funding um, is not available to, to transition to 100% renewable energy by 2025. The energy mix transition that we have carries us up to 2037. Right? I'm saying so by then we should be able to um, move as a country further and closer to the to the goals of going 100% renewable. Um, so th those are my comments, and the regulations. We mean obviously, um, we at, at the time we we were looking at, at, at several different upgrades. I mean, I, I do hope it's always still on. You know, I mean, including the regulations of, of administering the gas project, the EIAs. I mean, I know thought that that was raised with the EPA before um, August, before um, the new administration for the gas of power. Um, the question of grid stability, the question of um, opt-in powers, opt-in um, tariffs, and those things like that. All of those were were, were being done and uh, were in some level of um, almost completed. But um, once again, I mean, you'd have to ask the new administration what, if, what the current direction that they will be carrying the, the industry and the sector. You know, what you've put really spelled out here is a... Uh is a recipe for financial bankruptcy for Guyana. What, what, you're, what you're doing here is, uh, if you take a look at it from a point of view of how you handle money and debt, is you're simply taking what might be any amount of surplus that you're getting from oil, which is going to be minuscule in my view and quite different from what you think, um, and you're going to put it into an expensive uh, natural gas project and you're going to be one way or another just transferring the money and you uh, let me go back to the prize that you, I think I understand and we don't disagree with is that you're trying to close your deficit you're trying to build your sovereign wealth fund and you're trying to spend on some some new thing some new areas um which i hope is not exclusively energy i don't think i've seen in any of your planning documents but what you just did was you just took all of your profit and put it into a into a natural gas scheme or whatever it is just on the debt level so you've really created a situation where you're not only not making enough money on your oil and oil because you're willing to accept this contract that is that is that is highly lopsided but you're then going to take whatever resources you get and give it back to the fossil fuel interests and not be able to take care of your country i mean you, I, I see this is this is a this is a debt this is made up this is a deal made up by fossil fuel interests and bankers and it's not in your best interest i i i'm uh, you know i i have a lot of respect for the trouble that you're facing and the issues that you're facing and the fiscal but you've got the fiscal um uh, aspect of this backwards dr right. Marcel. so thomas thank you very much um, for that but but you know um once and and i think the what has been lacking um in the country in guyana in this entire discussion is a really holistic debate on the alternative so you have put forward your opinion and, and, and i have no doubt you're the expert on it and I mean, i'm expert in nothing um however um let's hear what i mean i think you I mean you you just you just said right what are the alternatives available for us to I, i'm speaking now here as the former energy minister what are the alternatives available to to meeting the needs and the demands of the country um so mr patterson uh 
thank you very much for your comment, and I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Sanzillo. I'm also interested uh, in hearing if there are any uh, responses from Dr. Marcel or Ms. Janke before we conclude the aspect of discussion on gas to shore. In, in, all, in, all, in all completeness, you know, I mean, Thomas has made some very um, uh, profound statements, which I absolutely have zero, um, zero, zero, Take quorums, which and I do think that he is obviously valid. He is the expert in it. However, you know, I mean, so we also should I mean um, use the opportunity of him being here to, to also ask us ex explore what are the alternative, the alternative routes that he would prefer. Not in depth, but just generally say that he would recommend that you go and borrow the money. Um, he would recommend that we do energy policies to conserve energy. You know, I mean, I, I don't know. So you should just leave statements like those um, in an oil and gas discussion um, just open-ended, I would hope. No, Mr. Patterson, that is not what we're doing. Uh, but before we get into that, I would like to allow the uh, women on the panel to also extend, uh, express their thoughts on some of the things that they've heard and to say whether they would like to make an input before we move, uh, move on to another aspect of this discussion. Yeah, I'd be I'd be keen to take this up a little. I mean, just to to raise the point that, um, you know, access to energy is a critical instrument of uh, of raising prosperity uh, and economic growth, and it is important to have access to energy. Um, it's important for the hinterland, and it's important for the urbanized areas. Um, so I think it's pretty clear, as Mr. Patterson said, that we're not going to get 100% renewables by 2025. Uh, that's a pipe dream, if I can use that word. Um, that doesn't mean that renewables shouldn't aggressively be pursued, because that is the end game. Um, but in the, in the immediate term, we have uh, heavy fuel being burned for power, and we don't have renewables. So. Um, I think that the, if the gas project is designed carefully um, and it is clear that the gas will be affordable, that's one thing. Uh, the, the problem in Ghana, which Melinda raised, was that it was, it was the, the Senkofa field, uh, the, the, the gas price wasn't actually affordable. So the project would never make sense. It would always have to be subsidized. And that would always create a spiral of debt for government or, or non-payment uh, for the gas. And so that's a real issue. I think it's, it's looking at what is the, what, you look at the merits of the project. Is it, do the economics make sense? Yes or no. Uh, how much do you, are you willing to pay for it? What gains do you get in terms of raising prosperity and, and economic growth in the country? And I think, and these are, these, the, I, I think, I can see potential merits to it without having seen the, you know, the, the fine print. Thank you, Dr. Marcel. Ms. Janke? Yes, I'm always interested when people say, do the economics work? Because Joseph Stiglitz and Nick Stern, who are two former World Bank economists, have both said, fossil fuels are out, natural gas is a no-no. The best thing that countries can do now for a post-COVID-19 recovery is to invest in renewable energy because dollar for dollar you get better, you get more prosperity, you get cheaper energy, and your country is back on on track in a in a more economically viable way. So by all means, let's see the economic analysis. And David, please do send me your reports. I have a feeling that they're going to be need, you're going to need to update that market analysis to take into account what has happened since then. The fact that renewables are cheaper and that renewable energy companies are actually making more money now uh, and are a better bet than fossil fuel companies. And Tom, you know much more about this than I do, so please correct me if I'm wrong on this. Uh, secondly, in terms of the World Bank's involvement in Ghana, of course, it was a disaster. Every World Bank project on oil and gas is a disaster for the people in the country. We wrote to the World Bank and we asked them to show how this proposed gas project would meet the requirements of economy and efficiency, which is what the World Bank is required to do under its own articles, which are an international treaty, and they couldn't do it. They wrote back and they said, ask the government. They cannot show 
how using natural gas meets the requirements of economy and efficiency. Now, the World Bank can't show that. This, this gas project is a non-starter. And we can kid ourselves by comparing it to white elephants like Amalia Falls, that it's somehow better because it's not going to be a disaster like Amalia Falls. That's not the issue. What we need to see is a robust analysis that looks at the market as it is right now, that takes into account the technological advances that have been made and serves the needs of the people of this country, not the requirements of the oil and gas sector who need somewhere to put the associated natural gas because they didn't put in the right equipment to re-inject it in the first place and burden this country with yet more debt uh, leading to a financial bankruptcy, fiscal bankruptcy. So what we need to see is something far more robust than promises of a rosy future. We need to deal with the reality. Thank you for that contribution, Ms. Janke. I'm now going to uh, attempt once more to just wrap up this session on uh, discuss discussing gas. And Mr. Patterson, before we had turned the floor over to the women on the panel, you had put forward a, a question for consideration by Mr. Sanzillo regarding the alternatives that Guyana should consider uh, in light of uh, his uh, view of it being uh, leading us to financial bankruptcy. So Mr. Sanzillo, I'd like to turn the floor over to you for your response and concluding remarks, and we shall go to a quick commercial break. What, you want a response now or are you going to go to a break? Yes, I'll take your response now and then we'll go to a quick commercial okay. break. This is not a uh, quick response. Uh, it's not a quick response. And it, go ahead. Go and ahead. Uh, and there are certain things that probably shouldn't be discussed publicly right now. Um, but I will generally um, lay out some of the things. Um, sure. You. Um, um, your fiscal situation, you're, you're heading into a whole new time for the country in terms of its economic and fiscal history, and you're approaching it with um, fiscal practices of a, um, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a of a of a of a mom and pop store, if you will, and uh, you need a lot more sophistication there. And that's usually done, not that complicated, actually. Many countries adopt five-year financial plans that allow them to say to themselves and to the public, this is our objectives financially on the big picture items and how we might be handling them. We would like to know, for instance, what you really are going to get um, from Exxon uh, and from your oil um, uh, profits for the next five years or so annually so that you have some kind of way of working around your your budgetary scheme and that you can then uh, plan your debt accordingly, plan your expenditures accordingly, make sure that your hospitals and others are other needs are met um, and not plan these things higgledly, piggledly off one going in one direction and one going in another. So that's a financial way of looking at it. The second thing is, is most places that are getting involved in the kind of revolution you're looking at in the um, change in your energy system would look to something that more akin to an integrated resource plan um, that would be somehow real, you know, linked to your financial structure, um, you know, and that would be that would take a little bit of time. You're probably a little closer there, but you're still pre planning um, projects and one at a time rather than uh, as a, as an integrated whole. Um, and I think those are. Um, and then there's a process of um, of getting um, getting. Um, a better positioning on your oil contract, which I don't want to talk about publicly, but which is possible to do. Um, and uh, I think the country of Guyana has tremendous leverage and it's not using it. And I, you know, I even, I look to, um, um, Valerie made a point before she said, well, you know, every time the company comes back, you can leverage them. They leverage nothing from Payera. You leverage nothing. You just gave it up, you know? Um, and, uh, and, uh, so there are ways to do this, um, and um, you could handle it a lot better, and um, but you um, 
and you know, and you can't conduct audits like I read in the newspaper yesterday. You yes. can't. You can't have a. You can't have a half done audit. You know, you you, you have to uh, enforce these things, and you have to enforce these things from the beginning. Uh, when you let it go once, it's gone. You you you're over. And Exxon is in a tough financial situation right now, and they're looking to take you for every nickel they can. And if you don't adopt that position and fight back, you're going to get suckered. And you're going to lose, and the country is going to lose uh, uh, miserably in this process. This is a tough time in the oil and gas business. It's not a time for um, um, uh, niceties. Thank you uh, very much for your contribution, Mr. Sanzillo, and to the rest of the panel. We will go to a quick commercial break, and when we return, we'll be looking at field development costs and how Guyana might be able to put systems in place to avoid the corruption pitfalls of this sector. Study internationally certified oil and gas course at Nations. They offer NBA Oil and Gas Management, ABIOSH, FPSO, and Oil Rig Safety Manager, NEBOSH International Certificate in Oil and Gas Operation, and LNMM International Oil and Gas Law. Check out their website for more information at nations.gy or email info at nations.gy. <music> Kiteshire Radio, keeping you informed. Demerara and Essequibo, 99.1 FM. Burby's 99.5 FM. Kiteshire Radio. Hello there, Guyana. You've asked for it. It is finally here. The Wake Up Guyana Show. Uh, with yours truly, Leonard Gildari. Monday to Friday, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Make your voices be heard. Call us. Text us. Kaicho Radio 99.1, 99.5 FM, The Wake Up Guyana Show. Prime bundles just got better with three new apps. Watch more with Playgo. Share more with Sportsmax. Read more news with Loop. Listen more with D Music. Plus extra data. It's simply more bundles together. 51 gigabytes for seven days for only $2,000. Live the experience with Digicel. Activate today on the My Digicel app. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If you're now joining us, this is a special edition of Guyana's Oil in You. It's our end of year program, and I am your hostess, senior journalist of Kaiser News, Kiana Wilberg. We have a very diverse uh, panel for today's discussion, and they include international lawyer, Ms. Melinda Janke. Chatham House Associate Fellow Dr. Valerie Marcel, former minister and head of the Parliamentary Public Accounts Committee, Mr. David Patterson, and Mr. Tom Sanzillo, the Director of Financial Analysis at the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. So, members of the panel, we just returned from a commercial break, and there are two areas that are very important to the oil and gas discussion that we have here in Guyana, and one of that has to do with field development costs. We are seeing millions, in fact, billions of dollars being piled onto uh, the table for us to audit. We have Pre-contract costs, 460 million U.S. dollars. We have a little bit more after um, 2015, from 2015 to 2017, and that is also in millions of U.S. dollars. We also have the costs associated with Lisa Phase 1, Lisa Phase 2, and Payara, and that is way over 10 billion U.S. dollars. We are still stuck at auditing the 
pre-2015 uh, costs. But we are still allowing this aggressive development of activities of activities, of projects. Mr. Sanzillo, I'd like to start with you. With this picture, do you think Guyana is on a dangerous cliff? Yes, I think you, what you, what you have here is, um, uh, although you'd like to live with the, um, and say, oh, we have this lopsided contract and it's okay because we can just do this and this. This is an ongoing thing. This is a this is a process by which Exxon and the companies will have developed a strategy by which every decision and every submission to Guyana is an us versus them kind of process, and uh, without the um, the skill and uh, um, hard nosed negotiating capability, uh, each one of those um, transactions is going to be a win or a lose. It's unfortunate that that's the way. But the industry is in such a bind right now that it has to pursue itself in an almost ruthless manner. Um, and so you'll see a lot of that. I wasn't quite clear on what that audit was in the newspaper, except that it disturbed me a little bit. I'm not quite sure if there, there's a 460 million, I don't know, I don't want to lose your listeners, but there's a $460 million uh, amount that's already in the contract. And I didn't yes. know whether they were adding another 1.2 billion, or this was actually part of another part of the contract, which is called total development costs, which is another part of the, I couldn't quite tell, and I would need to read the audit. But the point point is that um, uh, maybe the broader point is that the contract is written in such a way that there are many ways that Exxon Mobil can come in and make claims against Guyana by putting costs into the contract that maybe were not anticipated um, before, but that they, because of the poor nature in which the contract was crafted will be able to take advantage of as their attorneys and accountants who are much bigger and uh, and more experienced in these kinds of things than the Guyana government is. Um, they will take advantage of each of those little areas. When I reviewed the contract, that's kind of, I was looking at it from that angle saying, well, how would I strategically do this if I was Exxon to a small country that really didn't have a lot of resources? Um, to combat this, and I, you, there's just one after another after another opportunity um, to exploit the um, the uh, position, and then that gets put into a, a somewhat complicated formula. But it, it's not that complicated if you want to sit down and go through it, um, and it allows them to keep piling on costs. And every time you pile on costs, Guyana gets its money later and later if you will. So you, you have to pay them before you get a handsome um, amount of uh, profit that you've been promised. You'll get some. And as you did this year, you got some. Um, and uh, but you're, you're the as the costs mount up, it slows the rate of revenue that would come into Guyana. And so you're, that's what you're faced with. You're going to be faced with this nickel and diming stuff that Exxon Mobil is going to be doing time and time and time again, every day, all the time. And it looks to me like the first audit got botched. Um, and don't think Exxon Mobil isn't watching that. They're looking for every one of your weaknesses and they will exploit it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sanzillo. Dr. Marcel, uh, this is something that you would have raised uh, during the earlier discussion on uh, gas, and you would have pointed out that the review of field development plans is really an area uh, that Guyana really needs to ask some important questions, one of which includes, do we have the capacity to effectively review these plans and to ensure that uh, there are cost savings, which is something that you alluded to? Um, Considering these points that you would have made and other perspectives that you may have on this matter, do you think the time has come for us to really press the pause button on the rate at which we're approving contracts and to say, well, listen, you know what, let's focus on developing capacity? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a tough one because um, there's, a limited time frame yes. now for the oil sector. So there's we don't know how much time each country will have. It depends on the cost of its resources 
uh, depends on the market and how long the market uh, continues to want the oil. But we know there's a limited time frame. So that, that pushes a lot of government to rush to get the oil out so that they can monetize it before there's no longer a market. So that's, there's that understandable kind of uh, in, incentive. And add to that the fact that Guyana's partner, Exxon, is also pushing very hard for rapid monetization. It also wants the oil out of the ground as soon as possible. When you do that, the, the risk is that you're, you're no longer focusing on capturing the maximum value from the resources that, that are underground. So you're not thinking about ultimate recovery from the field, that is to try and get as much of the oil and gas out as you can. You're not focusing as much on, um, I think, at, you know, at, as Thomas was pointing out, the importance of an integrated, uh, integrated energy planning and development plan. Like you don't have the, you haven't, you don't have your map laid out so that you can fit this piece that one field, Payara, Lisa two, or whatever field, into that map and and make and optimize costs so that you're sharing infrastructure across fields. You haven't maybe anticipated all the ways in which there can be uh, re cost reductions because companies would be working together across fields or sharing drilling results across fields. There's so many sort of architectural kind of issues that you don't have time to design and think about if you're rushing through. And so I think I think the, the fast pace is perhaps too fast for Guyana. Uh, it would be too fast for m most countries, to be honest. Um, I think uh, I think on balance it's better to get it to get it right and slow it down. Um, without going perhaps as far as a country like Uganda did, which has slowed things down so much that now it may not be able to produce its reserves because um, it's, the cost of those reserves are not as attractive as uh, the market would, would want right now. So anyway, it's finding the balance, but I, but I, think, I think it's extremely important to, to have that sort of um, architectural or you know, policy planning view of the whole thing to really be able to ensure that there is long-term value for Diana. Valerie, what did you mean by that there is a limited time, that there is a, a limit to the market? What did you mean by this is a 40-year agreement, right? Oh, no, I mean, I mean that um, now that we've probably hit the peak demand, peak global demand for oil, uh, the demand for oil is going to, it has stopped growing and will decline. Uh, the producers that are the most expensive ones or have the most difficult projects, the ones that can't prevent flaring, are going to be the first ones to drop off. They won't, they won't, they won't be able to produce the oil that they have underground um, as time goes by. So the last man standing will be Saudi Arabia, most likely. But between Saudi Arabia and the most expensive producer, like, and the most high risk one would be the Arctic right now, perhaps. Uh, so between Saudi Arabia and the Arctic, in which order do the, do the producers drop off over the next 20, 30, 40 years? Who knows how long it'll be exactly, but, but there will be a decline. That's when Guyana is supposed to be making its money on the back end of the contract, right? Well, I mean, I, I think the payback phase is probably going to be something like four years for Lisa, isn't it? So I think it'll start to, the, the curves will start to be in Guyana. No, the favor. payback for Guyana, not for the, not for the, not for the uh, oil asset and the contractual arrangement for Guyana being, uh, get receiving its payback, not the energy transaction, the transaction, the fiscal transaction for Guyana is backloaded. They will only receive robust payments, the kind that you and I would look at as, as uh, being in the billions annually, only after there is a substantial 
a drop in the um, in the amount of the total development costs of the project, which is at least five to ten years from now. So where do you see the oil markets five to ten years from now? And will that then? This is why my report only went for five years because I don't think you can look much beyond it and get a really good picture. Um, but I'm really concerned about that, that this is backloaded for Guyana and the day will never come. That's why I asked about the the, uh, the, la the limits to the market. I agree with you. I agree with you on that. Okay. I think, I think emerging produce, I mean, any producer now negotiating new terms would have to think very carefully about paying the companies first for all the costs and, and waiting too long to be at their payback. Because I think contracts have to now take stock of that energy transition, and in, in order to ensure that the state's interests are are are, are defended. And that's not been done here, just from, from my point of view. Maybe some of the others would disagree, but from my point of view, that's not been done here. This is backloaded, and that's the that's your problem here. You're not going to see that money. That's my issue, and that's my concern, um, and uh, that's how I see it. And that's what, that's why I'm here. Thank you. So, Mr. Patterson, uh, what is your take uh, being here on the ground? Uh, do you believe that we are on a dangerous uh, cliff, uh, considering that we're yet to conclude the audit of the pre-contract costs, and we're piling on so much already from the other uh, projects that we're granting? Mr. Patterson, you're, you're still there with us? Sorry, I was muted. My apologies. Again. Yes, so I, 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 I agree 100% with Thomas and Valerie, who said that PR was a missed opportunity. Um, I think so. I, I know that um, it is was something that, that we had considered. Um, a little known fact was that, um, well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm unaware of any policy change in the former administration. But a little known fact is that we, um, when there was the oil and gas cabinet subcommittee, we had recommended that at the end of um, the Lisa one and Lisa two's agreement that we should slow out and, and take a step back. I think it's public knowledge. So Piero, um, so despite of what, what was going on, we had said, and this was done not only for the question of our lack of capacity, this was also done um, through the Minister of Finance, um, his reporting in the sense that, you know, I mean, obviously look, Listen to me, we have to be able to spend this money sustainably. Um, we just can't simply um, be looking at, like we say, Thomas, uh, to throwing a lot of money into a sovereign wealth fund if we don't have a full program. Um, and um, Thomas, unlike what you said, I mean, I'm, I'm not an uh, economist or anything like that, but my understanding from the how the sovereign wealth fund, legal or illegal, um, Melinda, I don't want that to go back there, was that the money went into the sovereign wealth fund and we and only a sustainable fixed amount could be taken out annually and, and it had and it was to address the entire um our entire development not only um oil and gas so the so the idea of us going and taking all the money in our wealth fund to build a gas pipeline was not um was not uh, uh, any in consideration i thought you were going to address how we're going to do how we could have been able to do that sustainably and not and the question of the pre-contract costs and, and, and our ability to um, audit these uh, reports, audit these costs, that I know has been engaging us as well. We, when, when there was the oil and gas um, subcommittee, which I was part of five, five ministers, this question um, arose um, almost at every meeting. Um, we agreed the GRA had to be strengthened to, uh, to maximize the value of our oils and gas I mean, and, and um, returns to us. Uh, so we do agree. We do agree that, uh, that we have to, 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 to build our capacity. We haven't seen the, the, the FDP for PRO. Uh, we haven't seen the reports done by the, by the two consultants. I mean, there's one was hired by the Department of Energy, and then there's one by hired by the, 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 the lady from Canada. Um, so we haven't seen those. We 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 we, we don't know. I don't know. At, at, at sitting here, what what were the, the the driving forces for the government to to agree um, PR as it is? I know from from our standpoint. Well, the last information I had is that we had several concerns on the environmental front, which I know um, there, there was a former um, head of 
EPA had said unequivocally he would not even be considering approving Piara if the question of flaring uh, was not addressed in the dumping of water, um, uh, water and several and two other issues, which I can't recall he had. Um, and we, as a, as, 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 as a, well, last information I have, I mean, I don't know, if, uh, once again, I'm unaware of any policy change, but we had set ourselves, listen to me, exactly what it is, don't overheat our economy, don't burden already li very limited resources um, to get it, let us sit down now and have the at least a one, the at least a two, um, that has been approved, Exxon cannot um, say to us that we, we're holding up back in such a way, and let us take, and we were looking at, I, I can say for sure, we're looking at least taking another 12 months to um, sit down and see if we can get um, capacity and to, 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 to um, address some of the issues that everyone here is raising worldwide and those things like that. Um, we acknowledge, and I and I acknowledged it earlier, that there they were certain, there are several loopholes in the contract for for Exxon on every, several little fronts. We acknowledge that they have been utilizing some of those loopholes on Lisa 1 and Lisa 2. Obviously, the one of Melinda is going to go back to his flaring. Um, we, we, are, we recognize that, 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 I mean, of course, when Lisa 1 was um, approved, they have given a commitment to zero flaring. They have given a commitment 48 hours is all they need to um, to flare for an initially startup. That has proven, that has not proven correct. So um, by the time prior came around, we recognize that all, it, it, it is not a question of accepting the, these their words, that we have to strengthen certain issues in those things. And, and those were the tools, EPA and, um, and several, and the, the, the approval of the F DP for PR were some of the tools with which we were going to look at it. And we weren't talking about, um, and don't mess you, get me wrong, we weren't talking about contract renegotiations or fiscal terms or those things that we were we were considering the environmental and the other regulatory agencies. But we know, Valerie, that the, the, we recognize at the time that the question of um, contract and fiscal terms and those things like that would have taken a bigger discussion. But, um, so in, 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 in some, we, understood and, and, and my administration best to my knowledge because of course i mean the, the cabinet subcommittee on oil and gas ceased to exist on the 1st of august 2018 however i still retained some um connection to the oil and gas sector to the energy um, thing and i noted best to my knowledge the priara was not um slated for any fast track or any uh, favorable quick consideration thank you Ms. janky your perspective on this topic. Thank you very much, Kiana. I think there's some confusion here. In terms of the flaring, we already have a legal framework under which the Environmental Protection Agency can stop the flaring. So it's important people understand Guyana can stop ESO from flaring now. It's nothing to do with the perm LISA 1 permit or the LISA 2 permit or PIARA. And there is this confusion. We have strong laws in this country and we need to use them to stop abuse by oil companies. In terms of the, um, the field development plan, first of all, obviously it should be published. These are pub this should be a public document. The people should see what's being done. ExxonMobil has come to Guyana to make money. That's what oil companies do. And to take any other perspective on this is to be extremely naive. Secondly, ExxonMobil is not investing in Guyana. And to think otherwise is to be extremely naive. They borrow money and Guyana pays the interest on that. They spend the money and Guyana pays for that expenditure when Guyana's oil is sold on the market. This is not an investment. This is free oil. And the, all of the costs are on Guyana. Now, both Valerie and Tom have mentioned this limited window. Um, the IMF has said in a report that, company, that countries who are currently exporting oil should diversify away from oil. What is Guyana doing? coming into a declining market and hoping to be the exception to the rule. 
and to make money from a declining market. Exxon Mobil is not making money from a declining market. So I don't know why the Guyana government thinks that Guyana can make money in a declining market with zero experience of oil and gas as evidenced by the abusive exploitative contract and the failure to enforce Guyana's laws which protect the Guyanese people. So this does not does not have a future. Thank you, Ms. Janke. Uh, so we are coming down to uh, crunch time because we have another program that is slated uh, to be aired. Um, but I'd like to close with uh, a very important uh, topic that we've been having here uh, continuously part of the discussions here at Kaicho Radio. And that has to do with how does Guyana protect itself from walking the same pathway or the same road that other oil producers have made where they, they've they made billions of dollars in oil revenue, but it ended up being a, a victim to corruption. Uh, to I'll start with uh, Dr. Marcel. You can give me your closing remarks along with the answer to this question. What can Guyana do to ensure that it does not walk the same pathway as countries uh, like we've seen with Angola and we've seen even with Equatorial Guinea? Well, <clears throat> it's uh, <laughs> that's a tough uh uh, it, it's a tough one to avoid. I think when you have the influx of this amount of money this, that will inundate uh, the Guyanese economy, the size of the, the, the scale of the revenues in relation to the size of, of Guyana is, is quite uh, impressive. And so I think, you know, the, the, there's, there's no magic bullet, but there are some, you know, there's there's transparency, publishing uh, as much as possible in contracts, procurement, having open bidding, procurement practices. Um, so th that's that's like a set of tools that are well known for for ex shedding light on on areas where there can be uh, some um, corrupt practices. But another one that's quite important, I think, is that with a lot of revenues, you start to have a culture of uh, cronyism, sort of um, giving contracts and, and uh, jobs and favors to those who support you. And you end up with a sort of an atrophied political system um, where there's no real debate over policy between two sides. There's just whoever's in power gives the most goodies to their friends, um, and you're not really debating that big architecture and that sort of what do you do with this oil and what is it really for? And I think that healthy debate is becoming more and more difficult in our current world where we live in a bubble and, and receive the news from the bubble that's gonna give us the news we want. Um, and I think it's really, uh, I think that would be something extremely important for Guyana is to try to foster opportunities for national debate for education, to trust your your scientists and your your scholars at the University of Guyana and other places to, to to hear to hear their interpretations of what's going on, I think it would be really valuable. Um, uh, so just uh, that sort of challenge in a in a space where there can be debate um, that you have that accountability because you're looking, you're checking the information, uh, but you're also you know. Uh, just having constructive dialogue. Thank you, Dr. Marcel. Uh, Mr. Patterson, what are your concluding uh, thoughts on this matter, and how do you believe Guyana can go about ensuring that it protects the oil sector from many of the risk of cor that comes comes along with corruption? Um, well, that that is a we'll have to take another um, session, a full session, if, if you actually did to address it. Um, but a couple of points I, I want to make and take the opportunity to, to make um, right away. The question of local content, we, have, we, we haven't been able to address that in this um, conversation. You know, I mean, as a country, we have to determine exactly what we want out of our local content laws and policies. Um, if we're aiming for skill transfer or industrial growth, 
Um, and once we have that discussion, uh, we can tailor our laws to achieve this, this these goals. Um, as we I mean, I agree with Valerie. I mean, um, open, transparent, um, tendering processes um, for uh, different. All the contracts can, uh, it, it should be undertaken, and and then obviously we should have a discussion. Uh, the last major discussion that that, that um, the country had on the way the country should go in the future with the national development strategy, and that was uh, that is about thirty years ago, if, I, if my um, recollection is correct. Um, you know, I mean, in my sector alone, I mean, I would have had a. 10 year plan on infrastructure alone, but I was in, integrated into the several other um, facets of our country education, the health sector, um, you know, uh, agriculture, and those things like that. I mean, so I, I do think that uh, right now is, is an opportune time um, for us to have a debate and a discussion on, on, on a developmental strategy. You know, I mean, the future where we want to go. I mean, personally, um, we felt that um, diversification and heavy investment in the agriculture. And the agriculture sector would um, would augur us well as a country. Um, so, what 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 we have to do, as I think, as, as a country, is everyone steps off of their high horses. Everyone, um, for the better of the country, put aside our our political and um, other agendas. I mean, we could pick them back back up. You know, I didn't say to to, um, to lose them all together, and have an open and frank discussion on where the country should be, um, I reckon 10, 15 years, um, that would and that would determine exactly how we go ahead from here exactly. And we'd have a unified position to deal with the um, oil and gas sector. Um, I think once we have a unified uh, position to deal with the oil and gas sector, we can resume our, our eternal, eternal battle, political battle and those things like that. But we know for sure um, what both, what everyone, from all the spares that the country wants and to see done, we can agree on it. Um, right now, as you know, Kiana, what happens is every five years there's an election, and then what happens, all that is done or achieved in the last five years are thrown out. So they're obviously you now we're back to almost back to square one. You know, I mean, I um, the, the sovereign wealth fund, if it's legal or not, uh, Melinda, um, there's no alternative in place if it's illegal. Um, the, the, the updating of the EPA laws, I mean, it, that was done in 1996, um, and it had no, and oil and gas wasn't envisaged at the time. I mean, it's sort of very uh, scan reference to oil and gas. Um, there's a local content, as, as I, I, I mentioned. Um, and then, of course, there's the overall um, issue of, of where Ghana wants to be vis-a-vis -vis CARICOM, South America, and those things that we have the opportunity um, to maximize that at this particular stage. You know what I mean? Um, just deliver, just deliver it on what we have now, or what is known now, you know what I mean? Um, and, 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 and get concessions, not from the oil and gas industry alone, from our neighbors. Or, or, so so I think that what is really needed is an open, um, frank, apolitical talk, um, discussion with all stakeholders. You know, I mean, it can be done as long as the will. It can be done within uh, 12 months. You know, I mean, you can have um, have a discussion in every region and then spend the last two months um, having a general discussion, and then we can uh, actually move forward as a nation. So that really is my hope for, for our section. Of course, the, the capacity and the technical capacities, and as well as the um, expertise and experts for, from from individuals internationally will help. But as a people, if we don't have a common vision and a common goal, um, no amount of foreigners, no amount of um, um, all, all due respect, my <laughs> fellow panelists, no amount of, um, um, uh, as I said, of, of recommendations will, will, will move us forward unless we as a country um, decide to move forward together. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. I'll now turn the floor over to Mr. Sanzillo. Well, the, oh. the contract, as I see it, is a uh, ma maximizes the opportunity for corruption um, for all the reasons that we've just given. The, the more times you, uh, the more time these claims and these transactions have to take place, the greater the opportunity there is for um, 
<laughs> mishandling of uh, of claims. So you have a you have a basic problem there. Uh, but so what I would say is that I agree with what Valerie said on, on the, the audits and competitive bidding and controls on cronyism. Um, there's a method that's been used that might want to look into. Um, it's called the Independent Private Sector Inspector Generals, and it's where um, a entity is established to work with a, a government or a government agency, um, and they are kind of an internal control uh, officer. They work with management and in an environment where there is a commitment uh, to integrity and high ethical standards, the process is carried out one way. Where there is a um, lack of that, um, the process is carried out another way so that the um, monitor or receiver is set up in a way where if um, um, the process goes awry, people go to jail. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a quick and immediate, and um, there is a due process, but it goes to court, and that, that's how the system is set up. I could show you. It's been done, it's done regularly in the, in the United States. It's done all over the world, in fact, um, usually in instances where corporations have had corruption problems or uh, governments have had corruption problems. I've been a, uh, uh, a monitor myself, uh, quite a bunch of monitor. Um, but um, and that might be one way to sort of really be serious about the, uh, the uh, corruption issue um, because it would be involved with the procurements and the audits and where corruption takes place and the details of the administration. You have somebody there watching it uh, regularly. Um, and then I would just say that the, um, the general thing which I appreciated uh, uh, Mr. Patterson today's comments is that there is an acknowledgement of the problem of full scope acknowledgement of the problem and that's a real important place to start. There was questions and discussions there on transparency. I think that's another way to proceed. Um, and then the third is on uh, the kinds of solutions. I think we would, there needs to be more um, discussions on those and, you know, will I'm, I'm encouraged by um, the discussion today. Maybe we can advance some more of the uh, things that we've learned and make some suggestions that might be constructive. I don't know, um, but we may try. So I, they help me a lot and I appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Senzillo. Ms. Janke, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Kiana. <clears throat> In terms of the oil cast, I'm not going to say very much about that because others have covered it. And really, there is no country that has escaped the oil curse. So if you don't want the oil curse, then you don't, you don't do oil. Uh, you don't build a country's future on a declining market. In terms of, the, of what, should, what should people do, we have strong laws in this country that protect the Guyanese people, protect the Guyanese environment, protect the Guyanese economy from the abuses of oil and gas development. And I know that David said that oh, we, the um, Environmental Protection Act is 1996. Yes, it's 1996. It also happens to be visionary. It also already covers the impacts of oil and gas. You don't have an Environmental Protection Act that deals with oil and gas. You have an Environmental Protection Act that deals with the impacts of development, of which oil and gas is merely one subset. We don't have one for gold, we don't have one for agriculture, we don't have one for wildlife, we don't have one for timber. Because you look at the impact on the environment. Is there an impact on the climate? It's covered in the Environmental Protection Act. Are there impacts on the oceans? Covered in the Environmental Impact, um, covered in the Environmental Protection Act. Is there public participation? Yes. Public rights to information? Yes. Do the public have a right to say what conditions they want on the environmental permits? Yes. It's all there. Right now, under the Environmental Protection Act, the permits for LISA 1, LISA 2, and Payara look to me to be illegal because they did not meet the requirements of the Act. We're hearing about um, the dumping of the, uh, you know, the pr produced water. That, that should not have been allowed, and that's a failure by the Environmental Protection Agency. When you look at the EIA, it says things like, the most commonly observed fish is the unidentified flying fish. 
which competent agency would accept that kind of nonsense? So the problem is not in the legislation. The problem is the refusal to implement the legislation and the failure and refusal of successive governments, because we're not being party political here. Successive governments have failed to give the EPA the resources that it needs. And this $185 million that is sitting in the fund somewhere, a good chunk of that should go into the EPA to ensure that they can regulate what ExxonMobil is doing, Exxon and its partners, and protect Guyana. We have good legal grounds for saying that the, um, the oil and gas is already being regulated, uh, is, is already covered in the legislation. That's why the World Bank wanted Exxon's lawyers to dismantle Guyana's Environmental Protection Act. Because it puts a break on what ExxonMobil and the other oil companies can do. We stopped that. The lawyers are no longer involved in that project. But it's going to take a lot more than that. There are good legal grounds to say that this $460 million in pre-contract costs, that there's no legal basis for it. It's not covered by Section 10 of the Petroleum Exploration and Production Act. I asked the minister what, um, what he's relying on. No answer. The Petroleum Agreement, there are grounds for challenging provisions in that. I already told you that the flaring is illegal. It should be challenged in court. The environmental impact assessments are inadequate. They don't meet the law. Now, our con the Constitution of Guyana says sovereignty belongs to the people who exercise it through their elected representatives. When the elected representatives fail the people, then the people need to act. We have strong laws. The important thing now is for people to use those laws before the governments decide to dismantle them. It's really important that people now use the laws that are there and don't allow anybody to tell them that they don't have rights because they do have rights. They have rights to information, rights to participation, and if they don't like the results of what is going on, they have the right to go to court and stop it. And as you know, uh, recently we went to court and the permits were reduced to bring them in line with the existing regulations. So it's really important that people understand if you want to protect Guyana from abuse by the oil and gas sector, you are going to need to go to court to do it. Thank you very much for that contribution. And to the rest of the members of the panel, I want to thank you uh, for your profound contributions. This has truly been an enlightening event and to our viewers and listeners wherever you are i want to thank you as well for participating as usual and i would like to take this time to wish you all as well as the distinguished members of our panel a happy and prosperous new year and i do hope that you continue to stay tuned to the kaicho radio as we continue to uh, have these insightful uh, discussions on the importance of protecting Guyana's oil and gas sector and the importance of just harping on the importance of educating our brothers and sisters. Uh, to our panel, once again, thank you so, so much for being part of this initiative. So, and, and I do wish you a happy new year and a wonderful day, guys. Thank you very much, Keanu. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you and Happy New Year to you and um, your listeners and my fellow panelists. It's been a pleasure and I hope that 2021 it's a, be a fruitful and productive year for all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, viewers and listeners. Thank you very much, Kiana and fellow panelists. Good Thanks. wishes to you all. Thank you very much. Do have a good day. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.